So like I said, last week we covered the basics of random vibration, okay, and that involved first off looking at some of the statistical information that's required for random vibration, okay, we covered, we talked about what non-deterministic motion was, you know, the, the stuff up to now has been deterministic in, in the sense that we know exactly the values for displacement and hence velocity and acceleration, you can actually determine the numbers associated with that. The thing is with random vibration you can't say you know, the, the road surface, that, for example, that you're driving over has this ex exact profile, it's random, okay? Um, so the details are unknown, but we do know the statistics associated with that. And there's some statistics that we worked out. We know the mean, okay, which is the expected value of x. We can calculate the mean square, which is the expected value of x squared. And then we can also work out the standard deviation and the variance, which is sigma x or sigma squared x. And they're all related to each other, so you can work, as we remember the standard deviation, um, or the variance, is the, the mean square, okay, minus the mean value that's and then to the power of 2, the mean squared. And we also talked about the probability density function, okay, as in the sense that this gives you a, a profile under, uh, you know, under which all your values are likely to occur, okay. And the, the, the integral of the PDF we know is equal to 1, and then if you want to look at the probability that something's going to occur within a certain value under there, you can then integrate between those limits, and that will give you the percentage um, that we did. And the example that we did uh, gave us a PDF um, looking at rotor eccentricity, and we worked out that I think with 6.4% of the time you're going to end up with a rotor eccentricity of less than 2 millimetres. And that's the example we did in the, in the notes. And the important value that we sort of c comes out of this is that if you take the square root of the mean square, you get this thing called the root mean square, which, as we've talked about, was the statistical measure of magnitude of a varying quantity. So that gives you an indication of, of you know, the magnitude of the um, random vibration. And that's the important thing to bear in mind. And you want to avoid large values for RMS um, to make sure your system survives. That we then moved on last week to power spectral density, and like I said, I think the way that I presented it perhaps last week was a little bit um, was a bit challenging. So I thought, I'll tell you what, I'm going to just re slightly re change the focus. Let's not worry too much about the math behind it, okay? Except we're going to focus on the math that you're going to need to know, okay? So um, we're not going to go through the derivation of s, okay? Um, but suffice to say that it's a frequency spectrum signal. It's in terms of omega or in terms of frequency in hertz, okay, s of f or s of omega. And like I said, the PSD is a function that shows the strength of the variations in a function of frequency. And it's called power spectral density because often power spectral density will be, will be in terms of watts per hertz, okay, watts being a unit of power. Now we're in vibrations, we often talk about power in, in the sense, you know, power in inverted commas, because what we're actually dealing with, what we're actually interested in, is acceleration per hertz. So that's why you get the g squared per radians per second, or g squared per hertz, depending on which one you're dealing with. And g is obviously 9.81 meters per second squared. So you can see that that's an acceleration for a specific frequency. Okay? Represented by s, big S, okay? And power like I said, it's a, it's, a, it's a description of how power is distributed over a range of frequencies. That's what power spectral density is. And a typical curve of PSD looks like this, okay? Um, this is in terms of omega, so radians per second. You've got Sx, so omega there, okay? And it's e you can see that it's even, so it can be reflected about the y-axis. You can see that it's real, okay? Because it shows up on a, on a real set of axes. And it's also non-negative, it doesn't drop below this line, okay? So it's always positive. And this is known as a double-sided um, spectrum, and so you can write it S plus omega to minus omega, okay, which is up there. You can also write it in terms of a single-sided spectrum in terms of hertz. And there's a, uh, there's a relationship between uh, S of F, which is the, um, in terms of hertz, and S of omega, and the, you basically you multiply the, the version in terms of radians per second by, by 4 pi, and you get the single-sided spectrum in terms of frequency. 
And like, like I said, what you might happen is that you're given this information and you need to work out what it is in terms of omega. So you, you can divide by 4 pi. And we'll go through that in the example. Now, one of the important aspects why we're looking at PSD, like I said, XRMS, the root mean square, is a really important value to obtain. And the advantage of power spectral density is you take the integral of the power spectral density and you get your mean square. And obviously, to get the root mean square, you take the square root of it. OK, so the whole idea behind this work is we work out what S omega is, your output spectral density. You take the root means, uh, you take, which is the mean square, you when you integrate it, and you take the root of that, you get your XRMS, which is what we're trying to determine with a lot of these problems. OK? So, like I said, you take the integral of the output power spectral density, that gives you the mean square, you take the root of that, you get your um, XRMS, which is what we're looking for. Now, to do that, how do we work out what the output spectral density is? OK, well, essentially, we need to know this thing calls the frequency, um, complex frequency response function, H. OK, H omega. And H omega is essentially the transfer function relating the input and the output together, OK? Um, and it, and it, like I said, it forms part of this relationship. You've got your spectral density of your input, so this is what's being vibrated, OK? Sorry, this is what the input vibration is. So say you've got a vehicle that's rolling over a road, and the road surface has a certain vibrational input, OK, represented by a power spectral density. You multiply it by the modulus of your, um, of your complex frequency response function squared, OK? And you get your power spectral density of the output. OK, so that gives us the relationship between the input and the output. You then take the integral of this, which gives you your mean square. You take the root of the mean square, you get your um, XRMS. Or X double dot RMS, if we're looking for acceleration. So how do we work out what H omega is? OK, well, you take your equation of motion in standard form, MX double dot plus CX dot plus KX equals FT for a damp system. OK, the input into this equation is the force. OK, so it's a force input. The output is your displacement. And obviously, um, if you've got displacement, you take the first derivative, you get velocity. Second derivative, you get acceleration. So if you know displacement, you can work out the other stuff. So the input is force, output is displacement. And so to get from that equation down to your h omega, the first thing you need to do is make a substitution. Now here, I've made a substitution. e to the j omega t, we know, is an oscillation. Back in chapter 2, the real part of that will be a cosine wave. <coughs> and then you make the same substitution for your x, because you know that if you've got an input that's an oscillation, you know your output is also going to be an oscillation for a linear system. OK, so you replace um, f and x, and you plug that into your equation of motion. So we take the first derivative of x, you get a, a, an omega that comes out front, or jc omega, in fact. So there's your j omega that comes out front. And you take the second derivative, you get a minus omega squared. So there's the minus omega squared term. Now, in the, you can see in this term, we've got an ej omega t, and one here, one here, and one here. So you can just cancel them out. That's why they've been, all been written away. You end up with this equation, the one at the top. And then it's just a matter of rearranging that equation to put the output over the input. So it's a fraction. So I've rearranged that equation. I've put x at, divided by f of naught. And that's our complex frequency function, OK? Complex frequency response function. And so that gives us this, uh, this fraction here, 1 over minus of m omega squared plus jc omega plus k. So that gives us this. And this is our h omega. And like I said, this is the equation down here is uh, what we said. So the output spectral density is the input spectral density multiplied by the modulus of the complex frequency response function squared. OK, that's what we saw before. And then, like I said, you take the integral of this, OK, which gives us e of x squared. And then, obviously, the integral of that side is an integral of this side, so you take the same integral of this side. And then if you can work this out, because you know what this is, that's going to be given to you, you can work out what that is based upon the um, system that you're analysing, OK? You integrate it, you're going to get the mean square value. Take the square root of that, you get your RMS. Okay, so that's the idea behind this problem. Now, often what happens is that h omega is a complicated formula, but it will have this form. 
Okay, and so this is a useful integral identity that is given to you on your equation sheet, so you don't need to worry about having to remember it. But essentially your h omega is going to be in this form, okay, with certain values for b0, b1, a0, a1 and a2. Okay, and if you know that form, if your h omega fits that form, you know that the solution to this part of the equation is this, pi times this function here. Okay. And so for the example that I did in the notes, b0 was 1, um, b1 was 0, and so on, and you basically just plug those values into your solution. You take these values, you plug them into this solution, and you get a value for that integral. So that's the, that's the theory. Like I said, what you do is you end up The mean square is the integral of the power spectral density of the output. Okay? And so the whole idea is that I give you an input power, pe power spectral density to a system for which you can calculate your h omega. Okay? You then work out what the output spectral density is, you integrate it, and you get your mean square. You take the square root of the mean square, you get your RMS. Okay? <coughs>